What time is it? It's time for another every other Wednesday. Oh, come up with one, Michael. Mm. I have one. Hello, everyone. Yes. Oh, okay. I see people walking in. Hello. Hello. Walking in. Why are they running in? Yeah. Well, they are. Are they sitting in? Are they swiveling in their chairs in? Yeah. Oh, speaking of that, I yes. told you, Michael, and others now are going to hear that I have a new chair, a new Very desk excited. chair, a new Good office for you. chair. There were, there have been more than one people, more than one person on EFW. <laughs> I'm still learning. Learning how to speak, number. Richard? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I, and, uh, but I'm, uh, I understand that there were people who, uh, have noticed that I used to rock back and forth in my oh, chair a lot. Yeah. This chair will make that almost impossible to do. So you're kind of locked in place. You're locked and loaded. Locked Can you loaded, spin? Yeah. Can you spin around? Oh, I can. I can spin around. I can oh. rock if I want to, but the other one, you, you almost had to rock. Wow. Okay. This one I can sit still. Okay. So. Now, oh, so now I'll be rocking from side to side. Yes, Carol. No, Carol, we won't be rocking at all. I'm going to try to stay very, very stable. That's maybe why you don't see many rocking chairs in offices, hey? Yeah. Like, you just don't see them. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, um, we do want to ask a question. Yes, I have a, well, we I have a question based, what, based on the theme days today. Okay, good. Yeah, good. What are the theme days today? Well, I'm so glad you asked, Richard. The theme days today are, include, I may be missing some, but here's a few. It includes International Lightning Safety Day. Have you ever been struck by lightning, Richard? You're I have not, but my sister has. And oh, I'm so glad you brought up my sister because what is the day's, what is today's date, Michael? It's Richard's sister's birthday. Today. Well, don't you have a sign to show us? Oh, Yes, it's June 28th. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Every Other Wednesday. It's June the 28th, 2023. My sister Nancy's birthday, and my sister Nancy has been struck by lightning. Fortunately, she um, she survived it, but so that wow. she could have a birthday. But carry on, Michael. What, yes, what so it's you? International uh, Lightning Safety Day. It is Parrot Head Day. If you're a Jimmy Buffett fan, mm -hmm. you will understand. And it is Caps Locked Day, International Caps Lock Day. You know, when you when you act, when you either accidentally or on purpose yell at people by communicating via all caps in your email messages. So why don't we do? And it's not yes, it, Happy Canada Day coming up. It's Canada it's Day this pre, Saturday. Yeah, Happy Pre Canada, pre -Canada Day. Day, July first. Happy Pre uh, and then Day in the Fourth US. of July, which is easy to remember. It's it happens every year on the 4th of July. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So here's the question for the chat box. And remember, every, yes, don't stand, don't stand under a tree during a storm day. Thank you, Bob. So remember to Frederick, change your Frederick settings. Frederick demonstrated to, caps lock day by everyone. Saying, yes. With caps lock. Um, um, so speaking of caps locks, they, why, don't, why don't we just do this question very quickly. What is your number one email pet peeve at work? When you get messages from your boss, oh, oh. from your colleagues. Oh, I know it. I know mine. What, what is yours? Mine is very clear. When people reply all, when they shouldn't be replying oh, all. Oh, doesn't that drive you nuts? Oh, and then there it goes back into the, and then you're in that this I endless to. chain. Yeah, there's a particular group that I belong to. And if Jeff Tobe were with us today, which he is not, um, he would know which group I was talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that drives me nuts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Other, other pet peeve, uh, other email pet peeve days, no subject line, unclear subject line. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, and, and then people writing, writing a, you know, four page email. This is not a place for your thesis. Short and, and sweet. Carol, Carol, you know, Carol, you are, you know, that you are one of our very favorite people. So we would never do anything to, to embarrass you or to make you feel bad. I know that there are people who have accidentally done it. I have accidentally done it too. I have this done that. particular group that I'm talking about. It's no accident. Ah, there you go. Yes. When when people, people email and say, call, call me, please. Me, please. <laughs> when the entire email is put on the subject line, yes. I think you should call people thread. and say, email me just for a old trip. threads and, to ask a new question. I got one of those last week. Yep. Yeah. 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 Just change the change the subject line when you're, you know, it's yeah, that's simple. just lazy. 
it's that's just lazy. lazy right it's just lazy oh There's... oh let me let me make sure that i remind everyone to change your who you're messaging to from hosts and panelists to everyone uh, if yours is not already set that way, okay? We normally have Sanjay to remind us of that. But anyway, Sanjay is not with us today and neither is Jeff. And and I don't know if I'll be able to be here the whole time because I will be able to be sitting here the whole time. But the reason Jeff is not here is because of internet problems. The reason that if I drop out, it'll be because of internet problems because Xfinity, go, I went ahead and said it, Xfinity notified us today that they'd be working on uh, on the internet in our area. And it appears to have been done in our area, but who knows? And I don't know if anybody out there has any influence with, with Infinity, uh, Infinity, Xfinity, just a suggestion. I mean, I know this is, this is not something they would think about, but could you just notify people a couple of days in advance if you're gonna take, if you know you're gonna take the internet down and they did know they were gonna take the internet down, could you just let people know ahead of time? I mean, maybe they haven't heard about this, but there are some people working from home these days. What? That's yeah. crazy. I'll talk to them after, Richard. Okay. We'll get this out. Yeah. All right. So I think we're ready to really get into this. Thank you for sharing your uh, your things that yes. really bother you. Um, I shared with you a couple of things that bothered me, and <laughs> one was about Xfinity. Xfinity. Um, I will not say a major uh a major um, internet provider, uh, but there are some things that affect our wellness. And so today we're going to be talking about wellness, about wellness at work. And so Mike and I were talking through kind of the the structure of how we'll how we'll do this today. What I'd like to do is just kind of start off with a little bit of, of history and background on corporate wellness awareness, uh, you know, in the workplace. Talk about some things that we have become aware of that have few companies are doing. But man, I think a lot, Mike, of what we could get today is going to be from our esteemed audience who will be able to say, well, here's what we're doing at our company or the company I've been with before. Here's some things with that. And I think everybody can kind of learn some great ideas about that. Um, we are a little bit remiss uh, six minutes into the show without introducing ourselves. So why don't you introduce yourself, my friend? Well, thank you, Richard. My name is Michael Kerr coming to you as I usually am from beautiful Canmore, Alberta in the Canadian Rockies. <laughs> and I research, write, and speak about inspiring workplace cultures with a special focus on humor in the workplace. And Richard. I'm, I'm Richard Hadden, and I'm coming from hot, sultry, humid Jacksonville, Florida uh, today. <laughs> Yeah. And um, I'm an author and speaker and I have written Contented Cows, Give Better Milk at All. And I talk about employee engagement, leadership, recruiting and retention. So a big part of that, obviously, is uh, the, the uh, physical, emotional and otherwise condition of people uh, in your workplace. Lynn is with us today from Memphis, Tennessee. Very good. How is it in Memphis, uh, Lynn? Because it's, I mean, I think it's just pretty hot in a it's lot of places. Probably humid. It's hot here in the Rockies today. Is it? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We we broke yeah. a record in Canada for hottest May ever. Okay. And smokiest May, I might add. And yeah. smokiest, yes. Yeah. Our yeah. Canadian smoke has now reached Europe, evidently. So. Oh, wow. Well, it definitely reached the U.S. We know that. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. So you know what I found out about uh, kind of uh, this whole history of, of wellness because I think, you know, a lot of people, if you've been working, and I'm going to assume the people in our group have been working for anywhere from one to 40 plus years uh, have been in the workplace. And um, so probably nobody on our, uh, in our group uh, was actually working in the 1950s. Um, I was not. I was barely breathing in the 1950s. Uh, but there really was nothing uh, as far as wellness at work. Uh, before about the 1950s. I mean, the, the World War II had was not long over and, and people were just kind of coming back, getting back into the economy, into the workplace. But some organizations did notice that there were some mental health uh, issues from some of the uh, people coming back from the war. They talked about it and a few organizations did a few things about it, but nothing really big. Then like the first EAPs, the first employee uh, assistance programs, just the very first buds of those started in the late 1950s. That kind of grew in the 60s. 
you know, a little bit more in the 70s. But in 1979, Johnson and Johnson created the first that, that I'm aware of and that, you know, others who have written about this are aware of kind of formal program. It was called Live for Life. And it was an on-site wellness program. And it was primarily physical assessments and um, provided employees with education, and information on stress management, nutrition, and things like that. Um, and they also some, provided some support for high-risk behaviors like uh, alcohol and substance abuse and things like that. But it really didn't get to where it anything like what it is today until mm, a little bit in the 80s, a little bit in the 90s, and then in the first decade of the of the 2000s. Um, some companies really started focusing on this. And there was a survey done by the U.S. government in 2008 that reported that approximately 70% of large U.S. companies in the U.S. had some formal workplace wellness program. So that's what I know about it. What Thank you, Richard. You know? What do you know, Mike? What do I, what do I, what do I know? What do you yeah, know and, about it? You know, it, well, I mean, Even in my work, you've, you've been in you've been in the public sector, you've been in the private sector, you've yeah. been in the self-employed sector, um, and in your year in Canada, not in the U.S. So what what have you seen? Yeah, I, I I think it's it's certainly a very similar trend, and I think certainly since 2000 and onwards, I think with every passing year, there's more and more awareness about it. You companies are talking about it more. I've, I've noticed one of the trends I've noticed even since I started out speaking was in those safety day companies have where they're yeah. talking about safety. They've shifted or they've expanded from just talking about physical safety to encompassing <clears throat> mental wellness and mental yeah. health. And so this broader, more holistic approach, I think we've seen organizations shift to and offering offering all sorts of different programs that that even 10 years ago I yep, think you no. wouldn't have seen in a lot of companies so it's changing but I think there's still a ton of work. Still a, lot, a long way to go on yeah a ton of work to do a ton of work there's a fairly recent book it's somewhere on this bookshelf I think behind me well one called, with the humor advantage and uh well, yeah, yeah, well those books are everybody should get those and, and yeah. light your fire and the jerk free workplace that bookshelf yeah, that bookshelf. Thank you for that, Rich. The bookshelf blatantly promoting my books. There's a book called, it's a very depressing read, called Dying for a Paycheck. Yeah. And it is yeah. all about how, and now it's it's in, based in the United States, but the premise of the book is that the healthcare crisis, if you want to call it that, in the United States is primarily responsible because of workplace cultures. It is the number one driver of, of illness, and stress in the state. So it's a huge challenge still. We've got to keep working at it, but I think we have made huge strides. So let's talk about some of the things maybe companies are doing. I'd like to hear as well from our, our amazing audience, not just maybe yeah. what, what things you've seen, what you're doing in your companies, but also what your what your challenges are, perhaps what you think needs to happen yeah. in your company. Needs to be done. While, yeah. while we're waiting on that, um, you know, it's interesting, Carol says, you know, shift safety to wellness to DEI. I wonder what's next. You know, I and it, I think it does represent. Um, it does represent kind of a, a you know an, an evolution and, and a moving forward of all kinds of things that can help people to again be more contented. Is that a word? Can we use that word? Contented, like not contented cows, but contented people at work, because obviously when people are in a better mind frame, they're in a better frame to to do their to do their work. Um, Steven says, you may want to check out LG founded in 1947. Very good. Thank you. Well, and I was going to just from a personal experience. I worked for a large mega behemoth communications company uh, in the 1980s. And um, I was working in Washington, DC. It's the only other place I've ever lived besides Jacksonville. And my supervisor um, acknowledged that she had an alcohol problem. And uh, I mean, it really was quite serious. It was quite sad. Uh, and it definitely affected her ability to to function at work. And, you know, in those days, we didn't talk about it as much as we do perhaps today. But anyway, she was sent away for four months. Oh, wow. And it was very hush-hush. Yeah. But we knew that she was still being paid and she the company had sent her to a rehabilitation intervention. Yeah. She came back after four months and she appeared to be better. I actually left a few months after that, not because of her. Um, and then I went back a year later just to visit because I, you know, did to hang out with the old gang that I had, you know, colleagues that I'd worked with. 
and I saw her and she was there and she, to me, she was noticeably better. I mean, I, and she had been there. There had not been any times away from work in that period of time. So it made me think, you know, perhaps it was, I mean, they, hopefully they saved a productive employee with that. Yeah, for sure. So for let's, sure. uh, let's read some things that uh, our great audience is coming up with. Um, Lynn, uh, something new this year has been company-wide messages from our director of comp and benefits about mental health and resources available. She does an amazing job being open and candid with the important talk. Okay, I, I think that is so important to acknowledge this. And again, this was in early 1980s. At least they were doing something, but it was very hush-hush. And, yeah. you know, perhaps because of for privacy reasons and things like that. But to not necessarily to talk about individual situations, but to be able to talk about the situation in a way that's not fraught with stigma or right. shame. Right, being candid is so important. And, yeah. and that's certainly a trend we've seen in the last few years too, is, is all of this promotion about making sure people feel comfortable talking about it, right? Creating psychological safety at work. As I always remind people, we, we have to, when we're having a really bad day or, or worse when we're having serious mental health struggles at work where we're on the verge of burnout or we're just not coping with things or and it is it, it's becoming a challenge we have to have that that ability to be candid and speak up and and own it and talk about it and not hide it if you don't own your emotions then what happens as i tell my audiences sometimes is that bad hair day piles up on bad hair days and you end up with hair that makes you look like you're from the 1980s and you don't send the message to the people around you that it's okay for them to speak up and ask for help. So you're not doing anyone a service by trying to pretend that you're okay. It's, there's that great, what's that quote, Richard? You know, the, the Robin Williams quote, somebody in our audience probably knows it, right? People, people don't fake. I'm Mork from Ork, that one. Yeah, well, that one too, Nano Nano, yeah, most Nano. famous one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, people don't fake being depressed, right? They yeah, fake right. being well, being happy, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. Yeah. So yeah, being candid uh, is so important. Um, Frederick talks about uh, leading a cohort program for trades leaders, mostly males, uh, and 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 yeah, and sending that message too, right? That it's it's not perceived as weak or lazy to yeah. speak up about this any stuff, and especially, and we know from the research. How men work, need this more so perceived as weak or lazy yeah than than women very often men are still more reluctant to speak up and ask for help or say that they need help in yeah. many of these situations yeah oh and, and jenny points out they may have saved her life too talking about my uh my um former supervisor oh i i have no doubt at, at all that 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 that's what happened yeah um, wellness program is there advertised, however, we get so bogged down in work, it's overlooked as part of our workday. Workplace wellness is not visited on a regular basis. It's about productivity. Thank you, Pamela. I mean, that was one of the things I kind of wanted to get at with this discussion. We hear about wellness programs, and I, you know, I, I have not had a real job in more than 30 years. So um, I, I, you know, I dip into organizations and, and what they're doing, but my, but I have lived vicariously through my wife, who has been an employee of several organizations over the last few decades. And I was impressed with, with one of her employers, a, you know, a long time ago, when they began with a wellness program. And it was more about education and about uh, advocacy and awareness and so forth. But they, you know, they had, uh, there were incentives for losing weight, for exercising. You know, it was about the time that fitness, um, you know, meters became available and they had things like that. And I think there is real value uh, in those kinds of things that people will subscribe to them and will comply with that. But one question, Mike, for you and for the audience here is, you know, th there are programs, but then it, it, does that really become part of the culture or is it just a, right, we're, you know, we, we can check this off. Uh, window dressing, so, right? Yeah, Sometimes. it's a window Too dressing. Often. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is or it, it interesting? Or I'd like to hear about things that really are having a substantial positive impact on people's wellness at work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think those, those, those programs, those initiatives are incredibly important. But they, they have to address the symptoms, and they have to be incorporated into the overall culture. And it, it's a values thing more than anything, right? 
So you can have all the programs in place, but if your value structure in your company is such that, no, we work our tails off, you're expected to give 150% every single day, and we're going to text you and email you all weekend and, and overload you with work, and you better Somehow if well you do don't it. do that, it's a reflection on your character. Exactly. Right. You don't you don't want it enough. So it, it starts with the, the leadership, with the values, in, incorporating it into your culture. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of examples where I've seen um, where organizations where they talk about, um, for example, in, insisting that when leaders work schedule is done for the day, they go home. Like, I don't want to see you if you're if you're supposed to end your workday at 5 p.m., then you better not be here at 505 because you're sending a poor message to your employees. We want you home and healthy and to finish work. So there's those those kind of behaviors we need to see from leaders. I remember years ago, and it was it was Husky uh, Energy Company in Canada here where one of the, the senior VPs told his audience of leaders, they were talking about wellness. And he said, look, I'm, I'm a pretty busy guy. I am a senior VP here, right? Like this was a big mucky muck, incredible <laughs> responsibilities. He said he blocks off an hour every day for fitness and wellness. And he sent that message very bluntly to everyone. If I can do it, my expectation is that everyone can do it. So make room for your wellness. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. If he can do it, others are. Well, yeah. Mike, we asked our audience to give us input and boy, have they. Uh, we're getting a lot of good stuff here. So Lynn says our safety leadership program has now incorporated psychological safety and recent workplace violence training, really focused on the importance of treating people with respect and connecting with individuals. Now, Lynn, if you are still with the company that you were with when I spoke for you, then I know what company you're with. I'm not going to I'm not going to mention unless you do, but um, that that is great. And you also have included a link from your sister's organization, Institute of Living in Connecticut. So if everybody sees that in the chat, that's something you may want to um, want to look at. Lynn has raised her hand. Uh, what do oh what do we do with that? Allow to talk? Can we do that? I'm sure. going to hit this button, Lynn. Are right, you raise your hand? I'm going to hit allow to talk. There's Lynn. It says <laughs> unmute. Can... Am I unmuted? Yes, Lynn. You are. We can hear okay. Lynn Jimin. So I, I will just tell you, I am with the same company. I'm with International Paper. Okay, and great, great. We, um, it was very interesting to go through workplace violence training recently. We did have an employee who was caught in an um, incident that happened in the community. And she spoke. And then there was a lot of other training. But the whole focus on it was about how you treat people so that you can intervene early before you have a situation in your work. I just thought it was that that is a big change from what that violence training was five years ago. So it's very, very cool. cool. Oh, interesting insight. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, I didn't. Oh, I didn't know that we could do that. That, that must be something. <laughs> that must be something new. Um, so now now this feels terrible. I'm going to remove you, Lynn. <laughs> if you want to raise your hand and speak again, please do. No, I'm not going to remove you out of the thing. No, I don't. I don't anyway, that's fine. Um, but uh, now we know we can perhaps, uh, wouldn't it be fun to just see everybody, uh, Mike? Um, then Stephen says, Stephen Rayfield says, at Evergreen Hospice, we make sure our volunteers are monitored and regularly checked on for their mental wellness. They have a client who is near end of life. So it is very important that they help the, the person, person's families. Um, oh, and then Lynn also talking about participating in the Healthy Living Program in large part because it saves me $1,200 a year on medical insurance. So go. Lynn, this is perfect because this is exactly where I wanted to go with this, that I think from the, the articles that I've read and people that I've talked to, much of the impetus for moving this ahead was when organizations discovered that, yes, a healthier work, workforce is a less costly workforce and a more profitable workforce. And so, you know, you could question the, the motive on that, but I, I think that uh, it's kind of a win-win when you're healthy and because of that, it saves the company money. So there's nothing wrong with, with people saving companies. Yeah, and, I, and I, I think what, what companies need to realize too is that you're absolutely right. Once, once they discover the costs, which are enormous, 
then they, they tend to pay attention a little more. But I also want to want to remind folks that a lot of those costs are often hidden, right? They're really hard to see. Right. And but, measure, there. but it doesn't mean they aren't there and they aren't way <laughs> bigger than you might imagine. And then conversely, the benefits of focusing on this stuff is enormous. People just be, people being more productive, people being more creative and innovative at work because they're healthier, because their mental wellness is being taken care of. Uh, people delivering better customer service. It affects everything, right? Absolutely every aspect. So, um, Mike, we were talking about one Richard. particular employer, yes. Mattel. Mattel, yeah. that, you know, it's a toy maker. Um, they have about 10,000 employees. Who knew? Uh, but they have about 10,000 employees. And they've been kind of recognized as being, not. I don't, won't say on the leading edge of this necessarily, but they certainly are an organization that is serious about wellness and have recognized the importance of that. They identify five key pillars of well-being that are, they think, significant and meaningful for people at work. And I thought it was interesting to look at, it's not just physical and emotional. So it was physical, emotional, financial, mm -hmm. social, and career. Oh. And They've actually taken these five pillars and have woven them into their overarching strategy. And that's another point I think is really important it, to keep it from just kind of looking like something that's been, you know, kind of clamped on to the organization. I think if it's part of your strategy, then it has a much greater chance of being incorporated into the culture. For sure. That's very interesting. You know, yeah. and the, the social element, for example, that 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 reminds me of, of a lot of reading I, I, I just keep coming across in different books I've been reading lately where they, mm -hmm. they're talking about the physical and mental health costs of feeling isolated in, mm -hmm. in your life or at work, of, of not having strong social connections yeah. or relationships and how, how yeah. damaging that can be and how it is so positively correlated to improve mental health wellness measures when, when you have strong social connections. Yeah, and of course, you know, with so many more people working from home, uh, yeah. now working remotely, working hybrid and so forth and so on, that social, that social aspect is, has become, not only we have recognized how important it is, sometimes it's harder to attain uh, for people. Uh, for those people who want to do it now, don't make me go work in an office with other people. I am very happy right here. Thank you. So different strokes for different folks. People, people like that. Um, there's and, a company. And, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say that Lynn would like you to put the, was it Lynn or somebody wants you to put the, uh, Pamela, to put the uh, five pillars in the chat, please. Richard. Okay. Yes, indeed. Let me do that right here. Thank you. Social, career, mental, physical, financial. Was that it? You're, did you do that, but from memory? I did. I listened to you, Richard. I listened to, I hang on every word you say. Man. That's Physical, funny. emotional, financial, social, and career. Great. Thank you. you um, hmm. yeah. yeah, that's very cool. I would, I, I, and, and it's funny, somebody just asked me about this this morning before our call. So I dug out an old newsletter of mine, I don't know how old, maybe a year ago, where I talked about the Gooder, G-O-O-D-R, all in lowercase sunglasses company, where they created this initiative called Chill is the New Busy, which I love. There you go. Are those are those actually Gooder sunglasses? No. Or just sunglasses? no. They, they look, but you look very- They're nice. ones that fit over my real glasses. Oh, you look very I really nice. like them. Very nice. Um, so chill is the new busy, which I love. And they created this whole <laughs> system that. using different colors, different flags, essentially, for your overwhelmed status. So if you at a meeting, for example, waved a red flag, that would mean, okay, you're over here on the I'm feeling overwhelmed, I need support from my team from my people. Let's have a conversation and figure out how I can get back on this spectrum. So I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. I like that. There's another company. A lot of uh, a lot of our U.S. Uh, attendees will be familiar with it. Although you, as a as a foreigner, Mark, uh, Mike, you uh, you knew of this company too, Aflac. Um, Aflac. Aflac. Oh, that's so good. You did such a good job with that. So they're another company that, and of course, if you if you follow these kinds of things, it's no surprise that Aflac has for many years been kind of at the top of, of all of these lists of, of organizations that are really serious about culture and about a positive employee workplace. 
So they did a study and you know, it's, it's an insurance company for those who are not familiar. It's an insurance company based in uh, Columbus, Georgia of all places. And uh, a new report from AFLAC, this is a study that they did nationwide. So it's not just about their employees, found that 59% of workers are experiencing burnout uh, of at least moderate levels. And that's a seven point increase from the same time in 2022. And it's about where it was the same time in 2020. And if you remember June of 2020, we were trying to get our heads around this whole pandemic thing. Um, and then another thing that they discovered was in their survey, some stark differences in what employers and employees think about the mental health support that they're getting. So for instance, about 80% of workers say they need healthcare coverage that includes mental health components, yet only 60% have that, they have access to that. Meanwhile, 68% of employers rated their mental health efforts as much or somewhat better than, than a year ago. Hmm. So I think there's a disconnect between what people are, are seeing. And I don't want to. I don't want to uh, be the only one talking. I don't want to monopolize this mic. Let me let you talk. Do I have something else to say? <laughs> I, I will remember. It. I will remember it. That's that's what I have to say. Yeah. You know, well, speaking. Okay. What you made me think of when you when you said uh, talked about a disconnect there at the end. My goodness, the number of surveys where they survey the senior leadership team, asking, you know, what do you think the mental health of your employees is like these days. How you know how 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 much of a priority do you put on wellness at work? And of course, the numbers yeah. are through the roof when you ask the senior leaders very often. But then, of course, they survey the employees, and it's yeah. a, so often a very different, like an insanely different picture, like at the night and day. And it just yeah. shows sometimes this disconnect with yeah. the senior folks not really understanding what's going on from from the front lines, from the from the trenches. Yeah. And I had, I have been in two conversations in person, in corporate offices, or conversations with two CEOs um, in the last four or five months. And in both cases, the topic was brought up about burnout and overwork in the organization. And both of these CEOs, now I don't I take this in the way that I mean it. When I say both of these CEOs, and when I, when I say what they're going to say, I think they're Many people, and I would be one of them who might assume that these are male CEOs. I will tell you, both of these are women who are CEOs. And both of them said, hey, this is just the way it's going to be. People need to suck it up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Both of them. Yeah. One of them said those exact words. The other one said, I don't think we're burned out. Listen, we've got less work to do now. We, because of our technology and our processes, we've made it so easy. We've spent so much money to make it easier for our people to get their work done. Um, I can't... If people are under stress with all this, I don't know what they want. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the that was the reaction from one, and the other one just said, "Yeah, this is the way it's going to be. Need to just suck it up." Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had we had some discussions about that. Um, it is crap. That's well put, Jenny. That's very eloquent. It's crap. It's total crap. Yeah, yeah. So Stephen said, "Sadly, how, that's how the reality." Define, of... How would we define burnout? That's a great question, Mike. How would you define burnout? How would it, uh, there's, there's tech, my friend, our, 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 our former guest who we've had on here, Dr. Lisa Belanger is an expert in this whole field of burnout. So I know she would, she would wrap my knuckles because she would have a very technical definition of what burnout actually is and, and looks like, but I think it's, it's, it's more of a functional definition. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's for, for me, it's at that point where you are so overwhelmed with yeah. work, it's it's not just having one bad hair. We all have one bad hair day, right? We all have stress in the moment. Are, are you, you're not referring like to my I, hair today? I'm, well, my you? I always have a bad hair day, uh, but it's it's where it's at that point where you feel almost incapacitated to yeah. carry on, right? And where where you 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 lost almost your 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 connection, where you almost it can almost it can I mean it affects people in different ways, right? But it can almost be a, a, a numbing situation where you just feel like you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You are just disconnected emotionally. And uh, and and what we know from and Lisa talks about this all the time, what we know from the research in burnout is too what what is what is even more important often than the stress you're experiencing at work, what the research shows is it's what's happening in your off time 
that you need to do better to recharge your batteries. And if you never have that time to totally get away from work, to recharge, to work on your physical well-being, your mental well-being away from work, that's when burnout can really, really happen. And so that speaks to this whole hybrid work situation that we're in now and expectations and making sure you're having these conversations at work about, about expectations around communication and communication protocols. You know, are, are, are you texting one another after work hours? Are you emailing one another during the weekends and with an expectation yeah. that there's going to uh, be- They're gonna to have to uh, give some thought and, and do some work on this. Right. Well, the way I would define burnout, I think, is um, that you just, you get, as you said, you get to a point that you become overwhelmed and you just can't. I mean, you know, you, you've probably seen these memes or you, you've seen the, the phrase that people use is, I can't even. You don't even have to finish the sentence. I can't even. That there's just no way I can continue to function this way. I did hear someone one time say that you, burnout occurs when you get to the point where you say, I don't care yeah but i wish i did yeah that's a great that's a great one don't that's care but one. i wish i did i know i should i know i used to but i can't yeah I can't anymore. I, so I remember I, I, here's here's a very stark depressing example of that richard uh -huh. uh, i forget where i was reading it it was an article and it was about burnout with interns with doctors that are mm -hmm. just interning and they just go through like the, I mean, the, the schedules that they do, they're insane, right? And they are exhausted and they are going on fumes and they suffer from burnout. And what was just so striking. Yeah, I don't want a burned out doctor working on me. Well, exactly. And what this one intern confessed to was he said, you reach the point where you are so mentally and physically exhausted. And he said, this is horrible to say, I mean, I'm a doctor you reach a point where you are so beyond, I, you know, I can't even, that you actually, a little part of your brain wishes this patient would just die because I can't on. cope. I can't go on another second. Yeah. Like that's pretty bad, but that's the, the world we sadly still live in in too many, too many places and too many workplaces. Yeah. yeah. Well, Stephen, you asked the question, how would we define burnout? I'd love to hear how you define burnout. Can you give us some uh, insight on that while we look at some other things that we've got? You guys have been so good. Um, They're always good. I know, Mike, so I really good. feel like we should, we should share some of what you and I are getting paid for this today with our audience because- we I know. We really I should. Know. What, um, like what cut do we give them? Yeah, I think, you know, at least half each. Half each. Yeah. Um, hmm. Okay, so Carol, Carol says, raise your hand, Stephen. Carol, I know you were not a school teacher at, at, at any point in your life, as far as I know, but I think you would have been such a good one. <laughs> a good one. Raise your hand. Hey, what do you think, Richard, about um, this whole, there's been so much talk about shifting to the four-day work week. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Huge, huge. Yeah. What do you think? I, you know, I think my wife would be in favor of that for me. Yeah, but do, but do you wife, think this is a possible... A, yeah. one possible solution to better wellness? I think, I think for very enlightened organizations, um, I, think, I think there are some who, who would go that way. The data is so clear and it is so overwhelming. Um, and uh, the one study that I'm the most familiar with was in the UK. Um, and uh, some of you know, I have family members in the UK. Uh, and I mean, they just went to the four day work week, some of these companies, and not four days, not 10 hours, four days a week, but 32 hours a week and productivity went up and health went up and all kinds of things. Um, I think it's going to be one of those things that moves slowly and organizations are going to see it, but they're, it is so non-intuitive. It is so anti-intuitive that I think most organizations will not embrace it for some time. I believe it's, um, I believe it, it really, you know, because you, you, then you hear people say, oh, well, where does it stop? The, the one day work week, you know, come on. Um, come on, come on. Yeah. People. yeah. And as, um, as some, as Jenny has just put it, we just put this in place for summer months, 11 weeks, basically it's 11 extra vacation days. I mean, that's, that's brilliant. As, yeah. To do it for a limited time of the year, even. Well, and especially summer, right? I mean, how yeah. brilliant is that? Yeah. 
absolutely. Yeah. And here, you know, and and hoping that this will show how productive we still are. And, and certainly that's what the research shows almost across mm -hmm. the board is people are yeah. just as productive, if not more productive. Right. You think and about I, the amount must... of time that is wasted in a typical yeah. work week. And I'm a strong believer in, you know, in performance-based, you know, results-based management. Now, obviously, there are things where people have to be there to attend to customers. Right. But one of the questions that I ask in almost every presentation is, are you looking for attendance or are you looking for results? And in many cases, results are far better than, it. you know, attendance could almost be, uh, be just not important at all, irrelevant. Um, but Jenny, thank you. I like that idea of, Let's try it for just for the summer and, and see what happens. So Stephen has answered our question when we asked what his definition of burnout is. The loss of energy and the loss of ability to make easy decisions. Hmm. Hmm. Everything seems impossible or wrong. It's just easier to walk away. Yeah. 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 Okay. And again, that kind of speaks to what you said, Richard, that just the lack of caring anymore. I don't I care. But I wish don't I care because I don't have the energy to care. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, did that answer your question about my views on the four-day work week? What, what do you? It did. It did. Think? Yeah. No, I I agree. I I think it's going to be the trend of the future for sure. Okay. I mean, it, it feels really radical here in in this country today, especially when, of course, this is a sample of two. Especially when I just have listened to two CEOs saying, "Well, you know, we're just so busy. Just suck it up. Get used to it." Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and and you look at the stats and the United States. I'm sorry, they're 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 a little behind in terms of. Oh, I know a lot of things. I know, I know. a lot of things. Vacation days, and you know, know, it's just one of my one of my best friends lives in Madrid, Madrid, Spain. He's Spanish. He's lived there all his life, and we've known each other for about ten years. And, and we're constantly comparing notes about work culture. And he's like, "Oh, how do you how do you do it? You know, is there they take a lot more time off than we do?" And I don't know. His his company is pretty productive, um, yeah. but that's a whole other. A whole other issue. So what do we think? We have four minutes left and we need to, we're going to talk about what's going to happen on June 12th in just a minute. But just in wrapping up, what do you, what do you think, Michael? What do I think? I think, well, to sum up, I think, I think it is encouraging to see more and more leaders and more and more organizations taking this topic seriously. I think we're trending in the right direction, but I think there's still so much work. Destigmatizing, destigmatizing the issue destigmatizing. Of, of emotional health. Yeah. Is, is yeah. that's made there's been a lot of progress but we've got to back up those words with with actions and i yeah. i think you know we, we got some great suggestions from the audience here today yeah and i and i think we have to it, again for me for me it speaks to just your culture overall exactly what we talk about here it has to start and end with an intentional focus on your culture and your values and your norms so that it's integrated into every aspect of your business, and not not just an not just an add-on, yeah, but, and, or, or just shuffled off to one pro to a department, uh, yeah right? program. Here's, here's well, the program. wellness like our, department like will our take care of our program wellness. and our wellness program and our yeah. well, no, no, it doesn't work like that, right? People, and I I liked the which is why I kind of clung to it was was the kind of expanding the idea of wellness beyond physical and emotional, you know, to, to include uh, all those things that you and both you and Carol memorized, um, but including the, uh, the financial, the you know, financial, yeah. because that obviously has, makes a huge contribution to someone's emotional. And we know yeah. that emotional feeds the physical and yeah. so forth. So love that all kind of stuff. Uh, let's see another good comment from Bob when COVID gave organizations an excuse to talk about people's health in detail that had never been there before it made it easier to talk about mental health in the same way that's that's yeah, yeah that's interesting great comment cool. yeah, ab right. absolutely absolutely so Michael what's happening in two weeks on June the 12th do you well, know we're going to be back within every other Wednesday because it'll be every other Wednesday by then and we have <laughs> special guests we have some special guests we actually guests. have three special guests, but they know each other. They they work together. We should also have Jeff Tobe back with us, I know, and probably Sanjay Nath will be back. So with us. it's going to be like one of those CNN mega panels. Yeah, it's going to have a big, a big thing like that. <laughs> so let me tell you, this is Jeff's guest. This is someone who Jeff uh, worked with and, and knows uh, to bring on, but I'm going to do my best to describe what it is. Uh, it is three people named John Putzier, J David Baker, and Peter Schramm. They all have master's degrees. 
in something, two of them are senior professionals in human resources, and one is a professional project manager, and they are in the process of writing a book called WTF. WTF, where's the fun? Yeah, for, for, is that <laughs> yeah. it? No. For people who know me well, that's, that's probably not something that you have heard me say uh, those three initials a lot. But uh, in this case, it stands for winning the fight for the, the workplace of the future. New rules and tools for the mm. new world of work. Where's the food? <laughs> where's the food? Who said that? Was that Carol? Who said, who, uh, where's the food? That was Jeremy. Where's the Jeremy. food? Jeremy. Uh, okay. All right. That's well, another good one. Be fun, whatever. And so I think probably what we should do as we open next week's, or uh, June 12th. Yeah, it is June 12th, I think, isn't it? I don't is know. June 12th? Yeah. I mean, look, uh, my, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah June 12th. 12th. Yeah. Um, and so uh, as we open, I already know what our question is going to be. What our question is going to be is to have people enter in the chat. And that is, oh. other than the obvious, what could WTF stand for? That's a you? great question. Let's do that. Let's remember that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. This has been Thank you another, all. just time warp 45 minutes. And uh, we're going to be back on June the 12th, which means we, we are. will, what, Michael? We will. We will see you every other Wednesday. We will see you every other Wednesday. My final words to people, though, was just going to be two simple words. Okay. Based on today. Be well. Be well. Very good. Well. Thank you. I will take that benediction from you. And uh, thank and you, my friend. Rest of the day. Thank you. Good to see everyone. Good to see you, Michael. Great to, to see, see your you. name, Lynn, coming up. And now we know we can do that. We might do that some fun. Okay, great. Bye, everyone. Bye, all.